Go ahead and go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16. This is a total side note. It doesn't have anything to do with the message. But have you ever noticed how many key verses in the Bible are 316s? I'm not a numerology guy at all, but there's a lot of key verses that are 316s. I keep coming across a lot of them. And here, this is a great passage of Scripture here. And we're going to continue talking about mysteries. And right here we see in verse 16, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Right there, the mystery of godliness is what I want to talk about tonight. And we, in that one verse I read to you there, there is so much in that that is just packed in that one verse that, you know, it's easy to just kind of read that verse and just, you know, sometimes you need to stop and you need to meditate on it a little bit. And I want us to look at the things that are mentioned because you know, what is the mystery of godliness? Well, it's basically laid out right there exactly what it is. I mean, how, how there's really no better definition I can give that, you know, God was manifest in the flesh, you know, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preach unto the Gentiles, all that. And I'm going to, we're going to go through these things and I'm going to show it to you in the Bible to hopefully help you understand the significance of this. This was a huge deal, this mystery of godliness. And so notice the first thing it mentions, how God was manifest in the flesh. And this is a new thing. I, I know God made appearances in the Old Testament, but understand, I do believe that it was, it was a spiritual body. This, when God was manifest in the flesh, it's referring to Jesus Christ. I mean, he was conceived and he grew in the womb and he was born just like you and I are. But this was God that was born. John 1, 1, verse we all know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And to make sure there's no doubt, you know, God put this in there even for the Jehovah's Witnesses. So they would know that Jesus was God. Verse 14, it says the word the verse one says was God, not a God, like in their Bible. It says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So God was manifest in the flesh. When people were looking at Jesus Christ, they were looking at God. That was God in the flesh. He was, he was right there. And that is an amazing thing. I mean, the one that they had been worshiping all there, you know, all throughout the generations, he was there. He dwelt among them. He lived among them. And I mean, just, I mean, what an amazing thing that was to think that God was there in the flesh. The creator of the universe came down to earth and lived as a man and was, was born just like you and I were born. I mean, you know, we ought to think. Ponder that a little bit and just think about that sometime. What an amazing thing that was. But, you know, a lot of people will take this too and where you see how God was manifest in the flesh and they'll kind of use that to teach the whole modalism thing, you know, that teaches that God just kind of took, takes on different modes or roles and basically God stepped out of his heavenly form and became a man on earth. But understand that, you know, we believe in the Trinity here. Okay, this was God the Son and God the Father was still in heaven. God the Father, he was still up in heaven, but he sent his son, who is one third of the Trinity, who is just as much God as the Father is, just as much God as the Holy Spirit is. And he came to earth. And look at verse uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. Because, so the Bible teaches that, or the, in the mystery of godliness, it says God was manifest in the flesh. So this was God. And I don't think anybody here would argue with that. I don't think any Baptist would argue that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And just so you know, you need to believe that that was God in the flesh if you're going to be saved. If you don't believe Jesus was God, I'm sorry, you're not saved. You've got, you've got to believe that he was who he said he was. And if you don't believe that, I mean, if, if he wasn't God, then he was a liar because he said he was God. And so keep that in mind. But now in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, coincidentally, another, another 316 uh, that we're going to see here. Uh, it says, or well, first of all, let's look at the second part of 1 Timothy 316. So he was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Okay. 
That's the second thing. He was justified in the spirit. What does that mean? What is the significance of him being justified in the spirit? Well, Matthew 3, 16, I believe this is when it happened. It says in Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. All right. What I believe was taking place right here at, the, at Jesus' baptism is you have the Holy Spirit descending on him. You have God the Father you, up in heaven. You hear his voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Everybody hears the voice of God. Everybody sees the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus. And I believe what was going on right there is they were witnessing the Father and the Spirit's approval of Jesus Christ. It, they were testifying that this is, in fact, the Son of God. This is, in fact, the Messiah. This is, in fact, God. The other two parts of the Trinity are there. They are testifying. Okay? They are, they are justifying. To justify, it's to prove something and to make sure there was no doubt that this was, in fact, the Christ. Okay, Because you remember, John the Baptist, he was supposed to be there baptizing until the one that was going to come and God was going to reveal that uh, you know th this was the Messiah, this was the one that he was waiting for, and he was going to do it by you know, his Spirit descending on him. And this was God, the Father, this was the Holy Spirit, putting their stamp of approval on Jesus Christ. This was them saying, this is, in fact, my son. This is... God right here. He was justified in the spirit right there. They proved that Jesus was who he said he was. So understand, you know, Jesus, he talked about, how, he would often say how I don't, I didn't come in my own name. He came in the name of his father. And he talked to, uh, when we were going through John, you might remember it talked about how, you know, um, he talked about how, you know, you don't have just my witness, but you also have the witness of the father. Well, when, when did that happen? Well, I believe it happened at his baptism. You know, they witnessed that this is, in fact, Jesus Christ. I believe that was God's way of identifying him. Okay, what, what, one of the things they still do today, if somebody commits a crime against you, one of the things that you often have to do is maybe go to the police station and you've got to identify that person and say, yes, that's the one that did it. They were the one that broke into my house. They were the one that assaulted me. Or whatever you're identifying them, so they know that yeah, this is we've got the right person. This is it, and that's exactly what was happening at Jesus's baptism. Is the Father and the Spirit were showing up and saying, "This is Him," testifying that He is in fact the Christ. And so that um, that mystery of godliness is you know Jesus or God becoming a man, becoming flesh, being justified in the Spirit. See, Jesus, He had his own soul and spirit, okay? And I think it's appropriate to use, you know, the trichotomy of man as they call it, you know, the fact that we have a body, soul, and a spirit and kind of use that to compare the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, okay? But at the same time, understand that Jesus Christ, he had his own soul and his own spirit, okay? Because of the fact the Bible says when Jesus, you know, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. Well, did the father go to hell or was it the son that went to hell? It was the son that went to hell. Um, look over at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 38. And understand too, Jesus had his own spirit. Uh, even though the Holy Spirit you know, is a part of God. But understand the Holy Spirit and the son, the father, they're all separate while at the same time being one God. But Matthew 26, 38 says... Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So was the Father about to die right there? No, it's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? And I'll show you a little more on that uh, when we get to a later point in this. So understand that, uh, you know, I, I do believe what was going on there at his baptism is he was being justified in the Spirit. And not only that, uh, look at John chapter 3 and verse 30. John chapter 3 and verse 30, because remember, Jesus, he had, well, when he was walking the earth, you know, from the time he was a baby till the time he was baptized, you know, he had his own spirit. But notice after he, got, he gets baptized 
and the Holy Spirit descends upon him and it lights upon him. Okay. This is once again, this is the Holy Spirit showing that Jesus is in fact God. This is in fact the son of God. This is the Messiah. He is being justified in the spirit. And in John three thirty, it says he must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And he that hath seen and heard that he testifieth and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. The father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Notice how it says that God hath not given the spirit by measure to him. Okay. In other words, God's given him the spirit without measure. Meaning he's given him every bit of it, full access to it. I mean, it, it's, it's his and Jesus Christ, he had the spirit, every bit of the Holy Spirit of God upon him. And God gave him that because of the fact that he was who he said he was. He was the son of God. Jesus Christ had lived a perfect life from birth to that baptism right there. He lived a perfect life. Only the son of God could do that. Only God could do that. And when that God was up in heaven and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The father's putting his stamp of approval on him. And then he gives him his spirit without measure, gives him every bit of the Holy spirit. The spirit was saying, this is who he said he was. And so there's no doubt. Okay. God left us no doubt that Jesus who was born just like you and I was in fact God. Something that I don't believe that they were expecting in the old Testament, even though we do see in the old Testament, you know, evidence of it. But I mean, some of that stuff was kind of vague. Okay. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, it's real easy for us to look back and say, I know exactly what that means. But imagine if before that happened, if somebody would have come along and said, you know what that means? It means that God himself is going to be born of a virgin and live a perfect life. I mean, that would have been hard. That, that was a mystery. Okay. It's not a mystery anymore. All the mysteries we've covered so far, they're not mysteries anymore. And this mystery of godliness isn't a mystery anymore. It's happened. It's been revealed to us. God became a man. He was justified uh, in the spirit. Uh, and then notice what it says. It says seen of angels. Okay. Now I think this is interesting too when we stop and think about it. Why does it mention the fact that he was seen of angels? Why was this something that was so important? Well, look at Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. This is This I think is very interesting. Something that we need to... Uh, you know, maybe just ponder on a little bit, but understand that since Jesus is God, you know, he's been in heaven, you know, with angels for a long time, since the creation of angels, they know who God is. They know who the son of God is. So when J Jesus leaves heaven and comes to earth, it had to be interesting for them thinking he's going to be on earth as a baby. Now, if you're an angel and you've known God, all these, you know, years for eternity, whatever, you're going to want to go down and you're going to want to check this out. You know, you're going to want to see this. Okay. I mean, it, wouldn't it be cool if there was a way that we could, you know, if you, somebody, you know, you've known for a long time, you can go back in time and see when they were a baby. All right. Well, you know, imagine what this must've been like for the angels to think, you know, God is on earth right now in human form. I've got to see this. And we see throughout the Bible, if you study angels, they're curious beings. Okay, and I'll show you some verses on that in a little bit. But look what it says in Luke chapter 2, in verse 8. It says, And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And I, I think there's a lot of reasons why the angel showed up at that time. But I personally think one of the reasons the angel showed up is because of the fact that God is on earth as a human, as a baby. I think they wanted to see it. And we see them on earth, seeing Jesus, seeing God in human form in many, uh, in many cases. But I, do, I believe they're curious. First Peter chapter 1, verse 9, you don't need to turn there. But it says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Talking about to the Gentiles. And that searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Angels are interested in the salvation coming to the Gentiles. Okay. Now I might, I'm, I might be speculating a little bit here, but one of the reasons I think angels were interested in this whole salvation to the Gentiles thing is because of the fact you say, well, why wouldn't they have been interested in the salvation for the Jews back in the old Testament? Well, understand that salvation as we know it today was not revealed in that time, even though it was there, even though it was present, even though people got saved by grace through faith, it was not revealed like it is to us today. But it was clear, I think the angels understood that God loved the Jews and God gave them a law, didn't he? God gave them a perfect and unholy law. That if they would have kept it, they could have been saved. But they didn't keep it, did they? And I personally think angels, they understood salvation by the law because they understand holiness because they're holy. And then all of a sudden, though, it was prophesied that the salvation was going to go to the Gentiles too. They had to have been thinking, how is that going to work? These people aren't even trying to keep the law. And I do, I think they were, I think that was something that they desired to look into because I think they understand, you know, salvation by the law, even though none of us ever had that, but this whole salvation by grace thing, it's got, it's, I think it's got them scratching their heads a little bit. I think angels often look at us and think, how in the world are these people going to go to heaven? But at the same time, we know that we are going to go to heaven one of these days because we put our faith and trust in Christ. And one of these days, God is going to change our bodies, isn't he? Into one like his glorious body. And I personally think the angels are kind of curious about how that's going to work. You know, God, how are you going to change those people into someone like you? Look how rotten they are. Look how wretched they are. And look how holy you are. That's something only God can do. And I personally think the angels are curious about it. And they're interested. And I think the angels were interested and they were curious when God is on earth as a baby. And then, no, but notice too, uh, chap, Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, another time when Jesus was seen of angels. Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. You're going to say, well, what's the big deal about him being seen of angels? Why is that significant? Well, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. Verse 11 says, this is after Jesus' temptation by the devil. It says, then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. What were they doing? They're taking care of him. They're helping him. Jesus hadn't eaten in 40 days. Okay? He's gonna, and he's a physical man. He's going to need some help. And I believe the angels came, and I think they helped him, probably nursed him back to health. Personally, is, is what I think took place right there. But angels were there after his temptation. An angel, and that was right after his baptism. Okay, right. You know, we don't see any examples of angels around Jesus in anywhere in between. You know, the birth and the baptism. Not saying it never happened, but the Bible doesn't tell us about it. But these angels, they they ministered to him. Uh, look what it says in Luke chapter twenty-two, verses verse forty-two. Luke twenty-two, verse forty-two. Jesus is. This is when Jesus is praying in the garden. It says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood 
falling down to the ground. So notice when Jesus is praying, the Bible says that he was in great agony while he, while he was praying, while he was in that prayer. And I don't know what it takes to get to a point emotionally where you're sweating drops of blood. But understand, Jesus was doing that, and it says in verse 43, an angel appeared unto him and was strengthening him, was helping him physically. So another example of an angel with Jesus Christ. And then, um, oh, I lost my spot. First, uh, Acts, we won't turn there, Acts 1, 9 through 11. At Jesus' ascension, there were angels present, weren't there? We're going to look at that passage again a little bit, but it mentions angels that were standing there, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? So we see they were there when Jesus, you know, was born and we see him when there, when he ascended to heaven and there was, oh, and also at the resurrection, I skipped that one at the resurrection, they were there at the resurrection. So why is that significant? Well, because of the fact that the angels know who God is and the angels never seem to have any problem with Jesus. They understood exactly who he was. They knew who he was. And not only did the angels know who Jesus was and know who God was, but you know what? The bad ones did too. Look at what it says in Mark chapter 1 and verse 23. Because remember, you know, the, you know I, I believe the devils are fallen angels. And look at in Mark chapter 1 verse 23. Is it says, and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. He knew exactly who he was. And why, how did he know that? Well, because he'd been in heaven before. He recognized them. He understood it was exa- he was exactly who he says he was. And then in Matthew 8, 28, says that when he was come to the other side of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? So we see that these fallen angels, not only do they know who Jesus is because they know who God is, they know that a time's coming where they're going to be destroyed. And they're like, what are you, you know, are, are you, is it, is it time already? You know, it, you know, it's not, are you come to destroy us before the time? They understand the power that he has. They understand that God made hell for the devil and his angels. They get that and they know that their time is coming where they are going to be destroyed and they know who's going to destroy them. They know exactly who is going to destroy them. It's going to be God that destroys them. And when Jesus shows up, they got scared. They weren't ready to face him. They're the, you know, it's, I, we know it's not time yet. What are you going and what are you going to do to us? And so just I'm saying all this to say that We have God the Father that testified Jesus is in fact my son. He is God. The Holy Spirit did it. The good angels did it. The bad angels did it. All people who would know exactly who God is. You know, leaving no doubt of the deity of Christ. And that is part of that mystery of godliness. God uh, uh, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, and then preached unto the Gentiles. Hey, preached unto the Gentiles. Why is this a big deal? Well, we ought to be very thankful for this. this is, and this is a big deal. And look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 42. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm so, I am so done with dispensationalists. I, just, I don't understand how these people have any credibility, any place that has a King James Bible. I don't get it at all. I don't understand these people who teach, you know, the whole gospel going to the Gentiles as being an afterthought. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. Talking about Jesus Christ. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not uh, fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God, the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. 
I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thine hand. I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the uh, prisoners from prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So it prophesied in Isaiah that his elect, talking about Jesus Christ, was going to be a light to the Gentiles. Okay, and it, and I mean, so first of all, right there in the Old Testament, we see it was God's plan to go to the Gentiles, that the gospel be preached to the Gentiles by God, by his elect. But you know what? You know, even some Jews understood this. And go ahead and look in Luke chapter, um, chapter 2. Go back to Luke chapter 2. This is shortly after the birth of Christ. And it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same was a just and devout man who was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Do you all see that? Turns out Jesus came to be that light for not just the Israel, but the Gentiles too. The Gentiles and for Israel, even Simeon understood this. You know, and so, you know, where does this stuff come from too? You know, this being an afterthought. Well, you know what? A lot of this comes from Schofield. All right? It comes from, you know, the dispensationalism. And you know what? You know, Pastor Joe Major, he has been just killing Schofieldism. I mean, lately. And I, I love it. And you know what? I, I, I want to show you something from Schofield's notes. I, I'm going to go all Joe Major on Schofield tonight. I don't know if you, if you, if you watch him preach, man. It's, it's good stuff. And he, he goes... He goes nuts on Schofield, and Schofield deserves every bit of it. But where, you know, where does this, some of this stuff come from? Well, it comes from his notes, okay? People act like they study the Bible. They're not. They're just reading his notes, and they're coming up with this junk. But go ahead and turn over to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. And it said, he said, Is it a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel? I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because the Lord that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Now what Schofield does right here is he inserts one of his notes in between verses 7 and 8. And he says, it says, Israel to be preserved and restored. Verse 8, thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. So what he does, you say, well, that, that seems pretty subtle, you know, there's no big deal, right? Well, what he's doing there, when he divides those verses, is he's making it out like, all right, we got the first part here, was talking about the Gentiles. And then later, God's going to go back to Israel. And that's what dispensationalists teach. And so when you put that note there, it makes it look like there's a division there. But should that division be there? No, it should not. And turn over to, because you know, I don't know if that verse sounded familiar to anybody. All right, but look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Turn your Bible, see what the Bible has to say, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. I'm fixing to go all Joe Major on Schofield right here. But look what it says right here. It says, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Right there in 2 Corinthians, he is quoting the Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. And they're trying to take that and say that this is something for the future that God is going to do. But the Bible makes it crystal clear in 2 Corinthians 6 that that time is now. 
Right now, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. He's quoting Old Testament scripture that was written to Israel. And if Israel's going to get saved, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If all Israel is going to be saved, they better call upon the Lord right now. They better believe in the Lord Jesus Christ right now. There is not this future event later that God is going to do where he's going to give them this other chance or he's just going to save them whether they like it or not. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And people have, they will take those verses about the Gentiles, about being preached to the Gentiles, and make it like it's just this, it's this temporary dispensation that's going to come to an end and where we're going to go into this other dispensation where it goes back to the Old Testament economy and goes back to the Jews. No, I'm sorry. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. They better get in before Jesus Christ returns. Now was their time to do that. And we see that, you know, it did in fact happen. He was preached to the Gentiles. It happened during his life. During his life, we see preaching going on to the Gentiles. Look what it says in, lost my spot. Look what it says in John, well, John 3, 16. John 3, 16. It says, or no, that's not where I wanted to go. I'm not going there yet. Oh, yeah. Well, Luke chapter 2. All right, sorry. Luke. Let's go to Luke 2 and then John 3, 16. I got my, my notes are all over the place up here, and so I'm all mixed up where I'm at. What did those angels say? Fear not. Behold, I bring you good tidings. What are good tidings? Good news. It's a gospel. There's a passage in the Bible where it talks about glad tidings. In the New Testament, it says it calls it gospel. Behold, he, they're talking about the gospel before the gospel is supposedly preached. What's going on there? Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. Which shall be to the Jews. What did it say at the birth of Christ? Which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. He, before the Jews even rejected him, the angel said, hey, this is for all people. Glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. So he was, he was preached to the Gentiles and it happened during Jesus' time on earth. And so notice what it says too in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. It mentions, you know, preach to the Gentiles and then it says believed on in the world. And, no, and now does that mean the whole world believes? No, but you know what? There were people from all over the world that did believe. And John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't say, it doesn't say God so loved the Jews that he gave his only begotten son. That if they'll believe in him, they'll not perish. And if not, I'll go to the Gentiles. Is that what it says? No, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He, died, he sent him for the whole world. It was not an afterthought. John 3.16 kills that teaching. But yet there's bozos going all over the place preaching that. And it's just, it's unbelievable that that's going on. And part of that mystery of godliness was preaching to the Gentiles, believed on in the world. And he said, well, when did that happen? You know, that, no, they didn't start believing on him in the world. Gentiles didn't start getting saved until after, you know, until the book of Acts. Well, look what it says in John chapter 12 in verse 19. Well, before we, here, you go to John 12, I want to read a few verses to you. But remember, it said believed on in the world. Okay, that was part of that mystery of godliness. And it says in John 7, 31, and many people believed on him and said, when Christ cometh, he will do more miracles than that which this man hath done. Uh, John 8, 30, and he spake these words, many believed on him. John 10, 42, and many believed on him there. John eleven forty five. 45, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. So notice all have been Jews so far. But then John 12, 11, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. But then in verse 19 of John chapter 12, look what it says. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world has gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee and desired him saying, sir, we would see Jesus. 
Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus, and Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Why did it was it significant that the Pharisees are saying the world's believing on him, and then some Greeks show up? saying, you know, we would see Jesus. And when that happens, all of a sudden, Jesus is like, my hour has come. You know why? Because part of what his job was to do as that mystery of godliness was to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and be believed on in the world. And I believe these people that came to see Jesus, I believe they got saved. They wanted to see him. And, I, and Jesus knew when that, ha when that moment happened, he knew. It's time to enter another phase of my plan. And we, got, we see him begin his path toward the cross. You know why? Because he wasn't dying just for the Jews. He was dying for the whole world. So, um, you know, so Luke 2.10, it proves it. It proves that he came for the whole world, not just for the Jews. John 3.16 proves it, that he came for the whole world. And so he was. He was believed on in the world. And then the last thing it mentions, received up in glory. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So right there, that last part, received up into glory. So this mystery of godliness is that God became man. And it was, this, was, this was a special period of time when God was on earth. He walked the earth in human form. It began at conception it didn't begin at birth, like Sam Gipp would like to try to teach us. Life begins at conception. He was conceived in the womb. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb when he was near Jesus. You know why? You know, and that's another thing that we could have thrown in there too, just kind of another thing that God did to show that they, this was in fact Jesus, is John the Baptist, he filled, was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And... The Holy Ghost knew when it was in the presence of the Son and it did something in John the Baptist as a baby inside his mother's womb and he leaped. And then his mother was filled with the Holy Ghost and she knew why he leaped. She understood and she knew what was going on before Mary could even tell her that she's with child. Before her virgin cousin can tell her she's with child. She knows she's with child and she knows who the child is. How? The Holy Ghost. Once again, being justified on the Holy Ghost. And so, I mean, it, it's, he, he, he was there in the womb, not at birth. He was God even while in the womb. And on, he was on earth from then until his ascension. He was taken up into heaven. The Bible says a cloud received him out of their sight. You know, why stand you gazing into the heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken from you, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Jesus Christ was taken away from us. Jesus Christ was removed from this earth. God in human form is not on earth anymore. Okay? But yet Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to send you a comforter referring to the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is with us. His, the Holy Spirit is with us and he's inside of us and, and he dwells with us. But understand though, that God in the flesh is not here. He's manifest in the spirit right now in our lives. We have the word of, we have the word of God, but we are waiting now for him to come back. We're waiting for his return. And just like there was that first coming of Christ, the first time when God came down to earth in human form, we know that when he comes again the second time, that, you know, we're going with him. We're going to be changed in that moment. So right now we are, we're waiting for God himself to come back 
in like manner as we have seen him go into heaven. And so when you see what the mystery of godliness is, I mean, it makes it so clear. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, and this is why I'm telling you, you know, we're not going to have anything to do. We do not call religions who do not believe in the deity of Christ Christians. Jehovah's Witnesses, they are not Christians. Mormons, they're not, witness, they're, not, they're not Christians. Anyone who teaches that Jesus was not God, I'm sorry, they are not saved. They, they are not believers. It was Jesus, Jesus Christ was in fact God, and it was, it was, it was a mystery. Okay? It's not anymore. This happened. We can look back in history now. We can look back because we have the word of God and we can say there was a time when God did. God became, God became flesh. He was here. He walked this earth. And he lived like you and I live. So you know what? We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what it's like to be us. He knows what it's like to have a physical body. He knows what it's like to hunger. He knows what it's like to be in pain. He understands the things that we need. He understands the things we go through. He had emotions. He cried. You know, he suffered pain. He went through all those things. God did that for us. And so we do. We have this great high priest. We have somebody that we can take our prayer request to and that will hear our prayers and that understands us. And at the same time, loves us he loves us even though we fail all the time and this was this was a necessary thing it was because understand it was god that created everything wasn't it and it was god that created man and you know what man i'm not and, and don't take this like i'm blaming god for stuff but you know what god did god gave us a free will but it was man that messed everything up and understand God coming down to earth and paying for sins, you can almost say it's like taking responsibility for, you know, what happened. What he's doing, you could say is, you know, God saw the mess that we created. And he was still holy. You know, he didn't do anything. I believe part of his holiness was him giving us a free will. But because God is loving, you know, what he, did? he said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go down there and I am going to, I'm going to clean up their mess. I'm going to, because because he's holy, he can't just turn a blind eye to sin. He can't let it go unpunished. It has to be dealt with. And the only way it could have been dealt with is by either us suffering in hell for all eternity or him coming to earth and dying and paying for our sins. And the fact that he would do that, that shows a love like you and I can't even imagine. And it was something, it was it was a necessity. Did they understand that in the Old Testament? No, they didn't. Was it, you know, did, is, are there examples of it in the Old Testament? Yeah, but it was something that was not revealed. It was something they didn't understand. It was. It was a mystery, but it's no longer a mystery anymore. There is zero doubt that Jesus Christ, who walked this earth, who was born in a manger, who died on a cross, who rose again, he was, in fact, God, and don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. And so that is the mystery of godliness. And so with that, let's all stand.